code. From bacteria to humans, the basic instructions for life are written with the same language. Even the cutting edge of mainstream science is now beginning to turn its mind to the fact that this is computer and this may well be a illusory, almost computer game. If you look at the codes that make up DNA, A, C, G, and T, or in my case, G, and T, G, and T, G, and T. Oh, I'll give, no, I'll give it up, give it up. I gave it up three months ago, sorry. These four codes, depending on where they are in relationship to each other, decide so many things. They decide if, if your body's a mouse or if it's a human. And the difference in the coding uh, compared with the difference in how it expresses itself in, in the different physical form is minimal. And if you look at those codes in the uh, Matrix movies, very, very similar, because the principle of that movie is correct. On one level, we are a digital, energetic construct operating beyond human sight. And the reason now they're talking about what they call human computer interface, where they can get the computer to be worked by the brain without any movement of the hands is very, very simple. They're connecting two computers. One immensely, staggeringly more advanced than the other, but still the basically same principle. What they don't tell us is that's how it is. When you look at the human body from a point of view of a computer, it ticks almost every box. Well, it just tick every box I've come across so far. When uh, the computer has a virus and it gets out of control and eventually it won't switch on, what do we say? My computer's dead. Why? Because it cannot connect to its energy source. What do we say when people die? We say, the body's dead. The computer's dead. The energy source has left, that's why. We talk about putting um, computers into sleep mode where they just tick over and... and, and, and uh, slow down and shut down to a very large extent. So do we. Then we've got Norton antivirus and all these other antivirus technologies. And what do they do? They are programmed to um, attack viruses and threats to the body, to the um, PC computer, desktop computer's um, functional system. We've got a Norton antivirus, we call it the human immune system does the same basic principle, because it's a computer. This is a picture, uh, an enhanced version of a picture taken at the Necker Hospital in a research pro process in um, Paris, and this is a, a motherboard. That is the motherboard of the body computer, and that's the system, the meridian system, the circuit board that acupuncture and other alternative forms of healing work on. Why? Because this qi energy, as the Chinese call it, going around the body and these lines, is information passing around the computer, just like information passes around the desktop computer. And they found in their experiments that when this energy is moving too slowly compared to optimum, the body starts to show signs of dis-ease and disharmony. Why? Because the information going around the body and being processed is being processed too slowly for optimum health. What do we say when we've got a virus in our computer on the desk? My computer's bloody slow today. Same thing. And the acupuncture needles and other forms of Chinese uh, acupuncture healing are there to... Um, reharmonize the flow of this energy so the information's passing around to optimum and we become well again. Then you've got the brain. The so-called brain of the computer, as they call it, is the central processing unit, the CPU. The brain of the body is the CPU of the body computer. It's the, the main processor of information, receiving and um, sending out. And it's decoding information all the time and therefore creating our reality. The DNA and the genetic structure is like the hard drive and the hard drive is passed on through what we call procreation 
which is like on a computer level, two hard drives fusing to create another hard drive, which is a uh, combination of the two. And together, the genetic structure and the auric field make up body consciousness, which has an awareness of its own and can function in this world pretty well, even without connection to out there. Pretty well, I mean, it can survive. But it's a manipulator's bloody dream. All these uh, things we call cultures and races and people and personalities, they're software programs. This is a guy called um, William Sheridan. He was in a New York hospital waiting for a heart transplant and he went on an art therapy course and he's meeting the mother of the person who donated his heart there. This was his art um, when he went on the course. He then had the heart transplant and when he was recovering he went back on the art therapy course and started doing things that were much more sophisticated compared with the real basic stuff he was capable of before. He had no idea where it was coming from. The art therapist had no idea where it was coming from. And he asked because he, through various means, he managed to talk to the uh, mother of the donor. He um, asked her if her son uh, liked art at all. And it turns out her son was crazy about art from a very early age. He wanted art materials rather than toys from the age of about 18 months. And doctors who have studied this connection between attributes appearing out of nowhere and personality changes in the recipient mirroring the personality of the donor, that, 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 that research is now uh, pretty extensive. People like um, the lady who had um, uh, lungs transplanted, who was frightened of heights, and then started climbing mountains. She didn't know for a long time when she was doing this, but the lungs came from an avid mountain climber. And it's kind of, all oh, this is strange. How can this be strange? How can this, be, how can this happen? It's because it's a computer download. The recipient organs and the energy field that goes with it are downloaded into the recipient's computer and then become available to affect the personality and to, to affect the abilities and attributes of the receiver. My great friend Crater Mutwa in Africa, the Zulu shaman, he told me, uh, when I, I called him, I talked to him about this some years ago, and he said, oh yes, he said, in um, Africa, when they used to eat people, he said it was a, it was a golden law that um, the people ha who they were eating had to be boiled uh, to a certain uh, temperature um, and for a certain time because the um, legend was that if you ate them without that being done, then they, you became them. You took on their personality. Now, one of the great ways that we identify with being this is I'm a man or I'm a woman. And nothing wrong with that, it's an experience. They're very different experiences. Great, fabulous, it's an illusion, enjoy it. But we get caught in the illusion that they're who we are. Suddenly we are in a, a place where we can get uh, manipulated and uh, diverted. Now, how can who we are be a man and a woman when the nature of that can be changed by chemical change? This is, oh, this is not, but it's a, it's a, a chicken indicating uh, the story I'm going to tell. Freaky the chicken. You might have heard that story a few years ago. Freaky the chicken started out life as a hen, laying eggs, all that stuff. And then suddenly, because something happened in the chicken's body to create massive amounts of testosterone, um, it grew a comb, it started crowing at dawn, and chasing the hens. Why? Because it had moved from being a woman, female, to a male, purely by a chemical change. Because it's the computer changing, not us. I got this from BBC News recently. Scientists have been able to take control of flies' brains to make females behave just like males. Researchers genetically modified the insect so that a group of brain cells that control sexual behavior could be switched on by a pulse of light. The team was able to get female fruit flies to produce a courtship song, behavior usually only seen in males. Why? Because it's a computer program, it's software. Sometimes I get up um, early in the morning, in the winter, 
um, before dawn, and I sit there in the office working on, on the website and stuff, and then the sun starts to come up and the bird song starts. And I'm thinking, you know, is there like a, a conductor with a stick waiting for dawn? I'm going, Jew! No! They just start singing. Just like Freaky started crowing at dawn when the testosterone came in. Because it's a body computer program, a software program. Then we talk about personalities and emotions. It's no accident, I would suggest, that so many, enormous numbers of uh, near-death experiences tell the same story, that when they've, le- when they've left the body in that period, they don't feel emotion like they feel it here. They're not cold, but they don't feel that intensity of emotion that we feel. Why? Because that's a body consciousness. Um, software program. This is why psychiatrists and people, they say, some of them, they can break down human personalities into about 12 archetypes and combinations of them. You can't do that with infinite possibility, but you can do it with computer programs. We had that lady in Britain a few years ago who um, had been in um, institutions, in and out of them, with real manic, deep depression for 40 years. And her personality, people say, oh, she's a manic depressive. That's who she is. That's her. 40 years later, someone said, what happened about the time this died? Can you think? Did you do anything? And she said, the only thing I can think of is that... um, I had something like 19 tooth fillings, mercury. It was pointed out that maybe that could be a connection. She had all the mercury teeth fillings taken out, went on a mercury detox, after 40 years, manic depression, gone. Because it was a computer uh, level of operation that was manifesting it due to a chemical imbalance. We're not even our emotions most of the time. We are consciousness, and we've forgotten, and therefore these computer programs, these software programs, take us over, and we think we, we're them. And so instead of driving the bus, we're sitting at the back thinking we can't drive it. The brain is two halves of the brain. There's uh, the right brain, and there's the left brain, and they have very, very different roles to play, especially in personality. And between them is this uh, bridge called the corpus callosum which bridges the information, again, information between the two. Now, this is another a picture that uh, Neil Haig uh, did for me recently. Um, symbolically uh, looking at what the, the right brain and the left brain do. The right brain is out there. It's creativity. It's inspiration. It's the maverick. It's the connection to all that is. It's the greater awareness. Um, and the left brain is about structure. It wants, it sees things in parts, not as holes. It wants uh, things to be structured. It's about language. And it's about um, organization in a physical way. It's about being what we call, though often that's not what it is, rational thinking. And both sides of the brain are necessary. If you get a right brain person, we've all met them, They're fantastically creative, but they're out on another cloud. There's nothing going on down here. But you get a really imprisoned left brain person, they can't see the connections with anything. They're here. Boom, boom. I'll tell you a story. Sound like Max Bygraves. I'll tell you a story. Not many people reacted there. Who's Max Bygraves? Shows me bloody age. Yeah, he's just a bit older than me. Anyway, what's... um, what happened was I was asked to speak at the Oxford Union, uh, Oxford University, right? Now, there are whole brain people at Oxford University. I'm not knocking it, but because of the nature of it, there's a hell of a lot of real left brain people at Oxford University. And I had this bizarre situation. When I, when I do something like this to open-minded people, I just give it, ah, there you go, there, there, there it is, make of it what you will. But when you're talking to a real left brain audience, even at the elite Oxford University, where they pass all these exams to get there. He's clever. I'm sitting um, in the hotel room before I'm going to do it, and I'm thinking, how do I put this in baby steps so they'll get it? Why? Because the left brain is what I was talking to there, and it doesn't get this wider picture. I'll come more to that in a second. Now, I want to give you an idea 
of this left brain thing. If you go to my website, davidike.com, and you go into the What is Reality Research Archive, you can see this 20-minute clip of this lady. Um, it was sent to me a few um, weeks ago, and it was like a eureka moment um, because of um, what she experienced. This is a lady called Jill Balty taylor who's a, um, a neuroanatomist, brain scientist for short, and um, she had a stroke which shut down her left brain, and instead of conking out, she spent hours experiencing what was happening while it was going on. And she talked about the fact that um, she got up, she, had, she was having this stroke, she didn't realize it immediately, and um, she got onto the exercise machine. This is how she describes what happened. So I got up and I jumped onto my exercise machine. And I'm uh, jamming away on this thing, and I'm realizing that my hands look like primitive claws grasping onto the bar. I thought, that's very peculiar. And I looked down at my body and I thought, whoa, I'm a weird looking thing. And it was as though my consciousness had shifted away from my normal perception of reality, where I'm the person on the machine having the experience, to some esoteric space where I'm witnessing myself having this experience. I looked down at my arm and I realized that I can no longer define the boundaries of my body. I can't define where I begin and where I end because the atoms and the molecules of my arm blended with the atoms and molecules of the wall. And all I could detect was energy, energy. And I'm asking myself, what's wrong with me? What's going on? And in that moment, my brain chatter, my left hemisphere brain chatter, went totally silent, just like someone took a remote control and pushed the mute button, and total silence. And at first, I was shocked to find myself inside a silent mind, but then I was immediately captivated by the magnificence of the energy around me. And because I could no longer identify the boundaries of my body, I felt enormous and expansive. I felt at one with all the energy that was, and it was beautiful there. Then all of a sudden, my left hemisphere comes back online and says to me, hey, we've got a problem, we've got a problem, we've got to get some help. So it's like, okay, okay, I've got a problem. But then I immediately drifted back out into the consciousness, and I affectionately uh, referred to this space as La La Land. But it was beautiful there. Imagine what it would be like to be totally disconnected from your brain chatter that connects you to the external world. So I'm here in this space, and any stress related to my job, it was gone. Again, stress, body consciousness. And I felt lighter in my body. And I imagine all of the relationships in the external world and the many stresses related to any of those, they were gone. I felt a sense of peacefulness. And imagine what it would be like to lose 37 years of emotional baggage. I felt euphoria. Euphoria was beautiful. And then my left hemisphere comes back online and it says, hey, you've got to pay attention, you've got to get help. And I'm thinking, I've got to get help, I've got to focus. So I've got to get help, I've got to call work. I couldn't remember the number at work, so I remembered in my office I had a business card with my number on it. So I go to my business room, I pull out a three inch stack of business cards. And I'm looking at the card on top, and even though I could see clearly in my mind's eye what my business card looked like, I couldn't tell if it, this was my card or not, because all I could see was pixels. And the pixels of the words blended with the pixels of the background and the pixels of the symbols, and I just couldn't tell. And I would wait uh, for what I call a wave of clarity. And in that moment, I would be able to reattach to normal reality. And I could tell, that's not my card, that's not my card, that's not my card. It took me 45 minutes to get one inch inside of that stack of cards. In the meantime, for 45 minutes, the hemorrhage is getting bigger in my left hemisphere. I do not understand numbers, I do not understand the telephone, but it's the only plan I have. So I take the phone pad and I put it right there, right here. I take the business card and I put it right here and I'm matching the shape of the squiggles on the card to the shape of the squiggles on the phone pad. Eventually the whole number gets dialed and I'm listening to the phone. And my colleague picks up the phone and he says to me, whoa, 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 whoa. And I think to myself, oh my gosh, he sounds like a golden retriever. And so I say to him, clearing my mind, I say to him, this is Jill, I need help. And what comes out of my voice is, whoa, 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 whoa. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I sound like a golden retriever. 
So I couldn't know, I didn't know, that I couldn't speak or understand language until I tried. What's happening is the left brain, because of what's happening to it, has stopped decoding vibrational information into human language and vibrational information into this reality. Therefore, it sees pixels, which is the next level of reality to this one. When I awoke later that afternoon, I was shocked to discover that I was still alive. When I felt my spirit surrender, I said goodbye to my life and my mind was now suspended between two very opposite planes of reality. Because I could not identify the position of my body in space, I felt enormous and expansive, like a genie just liberated from a bottle. What a wonderful expression of what, it's, what it is. And my spirit soared free like a great whale gliding through the sea of silent euphoria, nirvana. I found nirvana. I remember thinking there's no way I could ever be able to squeeze the enormousness of myself back inside this tiny little body. But I realized, but I'm still alive, I'm still alive, and I found Nirvana. And if I found Nirvana and I'm still alive, then everyone who is alive can find Nirvana. And I picture a world filled with beautiful, peaceful, compassionate, loving people who knew that they could come to this space at any time. And that they could purposely choose to step to the right of their left hemispheres and find this peace. And then I realized what a tremendous gift this experience could be and what an insight this could be in how to live our lives. And it motivated my recovery. So who are we? We are the life force of the universe with manual dexterity and two cognitive minds. And we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in this world right here and now. I can step into the consciousness of my right hemisphere uh, where I, uh, we are. I am the life force power of the universe and the life force power of the 50 trillion beautiful molecular genuses that make up my form. At one with all that is, or I can choose to step into the consciousness of my left hemisphere where I become a single individual, a solid, separate from the flow, separate from you. I am Jill Bolte Taylor, intellectual neuroanatomist. These are the we inside of me. Which would you choose? Which, would, which do you choose and when? I believe that the more time we spend choosing to run the deeper inner peace circuitry in our right hemispheres, the more peace we will project into the world and the more peaceful our planet will be. And I thought that was an idea worth sharing. Quite bloody right. And that is someone experiencing what I'm saying here, that we are decoders of information and this is an illusion, it is a decoded uh, uh, holographic illusion. And this bridge, the corpus callosum, is a target for those that manipulate us big time. When we take uh, psychoactive drugs, I did it uh, twice, uh, about 2003, it's quite an experience, but I uh, don't feel the need to do it again. What is happening is it's affecting the way our brain, mind, bodies decode reality. And it is opening up a wider range of frequencies. And um, we, that's why we experience extraordinary things. How can this be? This is not real. No, it's not real here, but it is real. And other times um, you access frequencies that are so far out there, the left brain can't work it out. I call it bugger me time, you know. Bugger this, I can't work this out. And, and, and you, you get these kind of um, uh, amazing uh, concepts and, and energies and consciousness coming at you and the left brain's trying to work it out. Well, you've got, you've, got to, you've got to decode it into something, you know, and it's like, all right, it's a, it's a turquoise eagle eating a Big Mac. Okay, have the, I'll do that. And then you go, hey man, I had a incredible trip last night. I, I saw this big uh, turquoise eagle, he was eating a Big Mac, you know. No, no, that was bugger me time. It couldn't work it out, mate, what was going on. And this is the target. The left brain. The soldiers on the door. This is a key to understanding this conspiracy. The whole of society is structured to turn people into left brain prisoners who experience reality through that version of perception. A partner's division, I am Charlie Smith. I must jump over everybody to succeed, I must be a success. People must say you're successful. That's my identity, that's my sense of self. And so what they do, if you, I mean look at the system. 
If you want to progress within the system, this left-brain society we live in, then you have to be very, very good at passing exams. You go to school, you pass exams. And what are you doing in exams? You're taking information given to you, you're putting it in the left brain, you're holding it, you're regurgitating it out on an exam paper by telling the system what it's told you to believe. If you're very good at that, you go to university. If you're really good at that, you go to Oxford University or Cambridge or Yale or somewhere, unless you've got a few quid, in which case you go anyway like George Bush. Anyway. <laughs> and then you choose your speciality. If you're very, very good at university, it's passing exams, boom, 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 then you get great degrees and then you get your speciality and you go into uh, d uh, being a doctor or being a scientist and being a, uh, uh, even a politician, all these people. And, all, and then therefore, all these people that are in the positions of power within the institutions that control and dictate the reality and direction of society are all, by the time they get there, fully paid up prisoners of the left sodding brain. That's why scientists can't get it, most of the mainstream ones. Because they're so in here, how can they understand concepts of reality in here? They can't. That's rubbish. I can't see it, taste it, uh, hear it, or, or, or feel it, so it can't exist. But it does. No, it can't exist. And I'm a scientist. I'm clever. <laughs> and so, if you look at society, you'll see more as the months go on. Um, you are looking at a society designed to put pr the, 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 uh, the centuries across the entrance to that. So this doesn't talk to itself, and they don't become whole brain people. We become prisoners, and that prison is the prison of the left brain. That's what it is, essentially. René Descartes, the um, French uh, philosopher and mathematician, said this about uh, finding a way to express self-identity. I think, therefore, I am. I would take it a stage further. And I would say, at the body consciousness level, I compute, therefore, I am. What we've been subjected to is mass hypnosis. Mass hypnosis, just like the stage hypnotist and the stooges on the stage, where the hypnotist puts into the stooge a programmed version of reality, a belief in reality. And then what happens is that belief edits reality to fit the belief. So suddenly they see an elephant in the audience, there's no elephant in the audience, but there is in their reality. They taste a potato and uh, taste a, uh, eat a potato and taste an apple because although the uh, electrical signal of the taste of the potato has gone to the brain, the imposed belief, the program, recodes that um, signal into the taste of a apple. The person is tasting an apple while eating a potato. Because it's all, this is what MSG does in food. They call it a flavor enhancer. What is it? It tricks the brain to decode more taste than is actually in the food. That's what it is. Um, and we're dealing with a mass version of hypnosis on the people of, of this world. Paul McKenna, uh, the, uh, he's a hypnotist and uh, uh, works with the mind of people, television shows and stuff like that. I watched, um, we just saw this, it used to be on the, uh, on the internet, I don't know if you can see it now, but it was from the Top Gear program on BBC. And if you haven't seen it, what happened was this guy, uh, Richard Hammond, he was put under um, hypnosis by uh, McKenna. And the first part of it was they were out um, filming at a racetrack. And of course, once you put into a trance, a programmed trance, a programmed reality, you lose the memory of being put into the programmed reality. That's how it works. Nothing's happened to you in your mind. So Hammond's um, just about to get in a car to drive McKenna around the track, and McKenna just went like that with his fingers, and, and, and Hammond went, boom, gone. And McKenna said to him, when I bring you back to a waking state, or worse to that effect, you're not going to be able to know anything about how to drive a car. He's come back, he has no idea that's happened. Sits in the car, got the key in his hand, doesn't know what to do with it. Completely, completely lost. Doesn't know the first thing about driving a car. So they come back to the studio live here, and um, 
they, uh, they have a laugh about it and everything, and Hammond thinks it's all over. But, you know, McKenna's sitting there and everything. And then McKenna does the same thing in the studio. Hammond, hmm. And he tells him that this car, this toy car, is actually his real Porsche 911 Turbo or something, some flash bloody car. And he goes over and he gets into it, thinking this is his real car. That's what's going on in his mind as he decodes reality. And then um, Jeremy Clarkson drives this one into the side of this one. He reacts as if he's just uh, pranged his real car. Why? Because reality is being decoded in his mind. And to him it's real. And that's what's happening to us all the time. We're asleep. We're in a trance. And that's why it's so appropriate when people say, I'm waking up now. I can see it. As Voltaire said, so long as the people do not care to exercise their freedom, those who wish to tyrannize will do so. For tyrants are active and ardent and will devote themselves in the name of any number of gods, religious or otherwise, to put shackles upon sleeping men. And of course, first, you must have sleeping men and women, and that's what the whole deal has been about. You are getting sleepy, sleepy. Sleepy, sleepy. Good evening. Now tonight's news. These people are hypnotists. Don't realize it. They're programming a reality by repetition of a version of reality that they pound out on their mainstream news all the time. We are not, we see things not as they are, but as we are. The conspiracy in a line. The idea is to get us to think that we are the person we see reflected in the mirror. No, that's the vehicle we're using to experience this reality. This is who we are. Division is what they want. A sense of oneness is what they don't want. And oneness, not, not just between humans, but between everything. You know, the ancients talked about, um, and some people still talk about today, about going and experiencing the spirit of a mountain or something. And of course, the left brain scientists, you can't, you can't experience the spirit of a mountain, it's a pile of rock. Because that's what the left brain, the left brain sees it. And yet, the mountain is just energy consciousness, and that's a holographic version of it that we see on the physical level. So you can interact with that, just as you can interact with plants. Um, this is um, uh, Virginia, Credo Mutwa's wife, and um, she's got a, a herbal garden, and she talks to her plants. And she puts, she puts uh, little coins next to them in thanks when she's taken bits of, off them to, to use in herbal remedies and stuff. And of course, the left brain is to go, what's, what's the plant going to do with the money? Is it going to buy a beer? It's stupid, you know. No, no, it's energy. It is a representation of energy. Oh, yeah, I get that. Oh, stupid. We are consciousness. We are energy. We are all one consciousness. So, where are we? Where are we? We are in our own minds, basically. We are in a, um, our own heads, symbolically. We are decoding reality in our own minds. It's not out there, it's in here. We are taking frequency fields and vibrational fields and we are, through the brain, turning them into a holographic reality that does not exist out there. It, holograms appear to exist in space, but they don't. Holograms you buy in the shops. This hologram doesn't uh, have space either. We are decoding it into a holographic television station within the frequency of visible light. We talk about seeing is believing, but it ain't. Believing is seeing, because what we believe affects what we decode and therefore what we see. There's that great line in a Matrix movie where um, the Neo character is saying to the Morpheus character, what is real? And Morpheus says words to the effect of, what is real? If, if you're talking about what we can see, touch, taste, um, hear, etc., then real is just electrical signals interpreted by your mind. That's absolutely what we're doing. Because the five senses decode vibrational frequencies and then send those signals to the brain, and it's the brain that decodes them into the reality we think we're experiencing. So hypnotists can manipulate reality in their various forms. The um, visual cortex areas of the brain do it um, in relationship to the eyes. What we think is out there actually exists, symbolically anyway, in our head. 
as the neurons fire in a certain uh, sequence, they create reality based on our belief. Now, if we've got open minds, we can be decoding vast, vast realities and be multidimensional in our perception and awareness. We can be in this world physically, but not of this world in terms of our point of perception. Therefore, we're going to see the world in a completely different way to those stuck in left brain consciousness. Or we can get caught in the eggshells, in which case we are decoding a very small band of frequencies, which makes us think we live in a world of limitation. We exist as an energy construct. These are the vortex points, the, the colors here, the, we call them chakras, wheels of light in the Sanskrit language. Um, the vortex points in the body. When, we de when this um, goes through the decoding process, it becomes the holographic image we see as a human being. But it only exists, we only exist in this form when we've been through that decoding process. In this book, uh, The Holographic Universe, great book where he pulls together Michael Talbot, the uh, scientific information uh, supporting the idea that this is all a great hologram, um, he tells a story in here, which is so brilliant. That's why I, I do tell it quite often, because it's so symbolic of what, what I'm talking about. He attended a party which his father um, had, and he had a state hypnotist along to do party tricks for the guests. There came a point where he, the hypnotist is dealing with this guy called Tom, and he said to him, he's doing through the tricks, and then he said to him, when I bring you back to a waking state, you're not going to be able to see your daughter in the room. At which point, the hypnotist led the daughter to stand right in front of the father who's looking in her belly. He brings him out of a waking, uh, to a waking state, or apparently so, and he says, Tom, can you see your daughter? Tom's looking around. No, I can't see her. She's giggling. He can't hear her. The hypnotist went behind the daughter, put his hand in the small of her back, and said, I'm holding something, Tom. What am I holding? He looked bemused because it was so obvious to him. He said, you're holding a watch. He says, there's an inscription on the uh, watch, Tom. Can you read it? He peered forward, read the inscription. His daughter standing between him and the watch. Now, from a left brain perspective, Professor Richard Dawkins at Oxford University or something, um, that's, that's impossible. You're one of these charlatans. But of course, from a left brain perspective, it's not possible. But when you realize the nature of reality, it is possible. Why? Because his daughter is an energetic... Uh, construct on, on that level, and unless his, her father decodes her energetic field into a holographic representation, he sees as her, his daughter, she ain't going to exist in his reality. Everything else in the room is, because he's doing that to everything else. But the, the, the uh, hypnotist has implanted into the brain the belief that the daughter is not in the room. So just like um, in China, where they firewall off the internet, his brain gets firewalled off from decoding that field. So she doesn't come into holographic reality. She doesn't uh, occupy what we call space he's going to be able to see what's behind her because in his reality, she ain't there on that frequency range we call um, the physical world. We think the world is physical. Let's come to that physical. Oh, it's so solid. Oh, yeah, walk into a wall. Bang, it's solid. Don't tell me it ain't solid. But it can't be. It can't be because it's, it's made of atoms, scientists tell us. And atoms have no solidity. How can a... Uh, an atom that has no solidity make up this solid world. It can't. And it doesn't. Because the world isn't solid. This is why when scientists have this bewildered conundrum between uh, non-physical atoms making up a physical world, how can it be? Well, I can help them out. There is no physical world to make up. The atoms are part of the decoding process of turning vibrational fields and vibrational um, information into holographic form in our heads or in our minds. We, we make holograms, of course, in studios like this one. And uh, for those who haven't come across it, what happens is you've got an object that you want to uh, do a holographic photograph of. You have a laser beam. Part of it um, is diverted across the uh, 
object you want to photograph, part of the beam is uh, uh, taken away and hits this photographic film where it meets the other part of the beam carrying the vibrational information of the image. It's like two uh, waves in uh, water coming and colliding. When you have, uh, they call it interference, an interference pattern in um, holographic terms. When you throw two pebbles in a, a pond, where the waves they make collide is a vibrational representation of those two stones, their weight, their size, and where they dropped in relationship to each other. And that's the same principle as holographic film. It looks like fingerprints and stuff. It seems to have no uh, form, no clarity. But you then fire a laser beam at this and bingo. An apparently three-dimensional image of what's been photographed appears before your eyes, appearing to occupy space, but not. These are all um, holograms. Some of them, the best ones, can look as solid as you and me. These are all holograms. With no space, no 3D, just the appearance of it. There's the queen, holographic um, photograph of the queen. Very appropriate when we get to the second half. <laughs> Queen's a lizard, you're mad. These, these are not very good holograms, but you see how they can appear three-dimensional. Planets. You know, we can have three-dimensional things now on computer games. And that's what we're doing. Taking vibrational information and decoding it into a holographic world that appears to be out there, but isn't. So, in a decoded state, this is what the world looks like. In an undecoded state, they are energetic vibrational fields. This reality has a number of levels, the coded and decoded levels. So we're living in a virtual reality game, basically, uh, of great sophistication. And when we know that, we can enjoy it. When we don't know that, we can become enslaved by it, and we have been. And scientists, it's funny you see, because these scientists, the left-brainers, there are now some real cutting-edge mainstream scientists in some uh, parts of the world who, who've opened up the right brain, and they're very impressive people. But, um, and they're starting to get this now. But the left-brainers, I mean, it's like, you know, you know in the um, pantomimes where someone's standing on the stage and someone, like a monster or something, comes behind them, and the audience is going, he's behind you! And they turn round, and the other person turns round with them, and they go, isn't... There's nobody there. He's behind. It's like that with science. Because they're trying to work out these realities. But of course, as they're trying to work it out, their brain is decoding it into a holographic, apparently solid world. But they can't get at it because everything they touch, everything they look at, boom, it's hologram. Boom, it's hologram. It's solid. It's real. So this is why scientists have to open their consciousness if they're going to get to the deep levels that we're talking about today. The other great um, uh, characteristic of a hologram is that every part of the hologram contains a smaller version of the whole. Extraordinary characteristic. So if you cut a holographic print, those you know, wavy frequency fields, the interference pattern into four, and you fire a laser at the four pieces, you don't get a quarter size uh, part of the whole picture, you get a quarter-sized version of the whole picture. Everything is a smaller version of the whole. And that is why this works and, and, and what it's based on, if people started to realize it. Things like reflexology um, and acupuncture and these other alternative forms of healing, they can find parts of the body, this is acu reflexology, acupuncture is the same, that re reflect in different parts of the body the bigger parts of the body so they can treat the heart from a point on the foot or the hand. Different parts of the ear, you can treat different parts of the body from a point on the ear, of course you can. It has to be like that because the body is a hologram and so the ear is a smaller version of the whole in the way it works. 
We have this thing, this, this, this uh, line that people say, oh, everything's as above, so below. Yes, because it's a hologram. So, this is why the human energy field is mirrored by the Earth's energy field, because it's a hologram. And every part of the whole, at all the different levels, is a smaller version of the whole. What we are living in is a holographic internet, as I call it. If you look at um, what we call the internet, which we use on our computers, the only place the internet exists in the form that we perceive the internet, websites and graphics and colors and texts, is on the computer screen. It's the only place it exists in that form. Everywhere else, it's, it's uh, electrical circuits, mathematics, on-off electrical signals, all the rest of it. Same with television. The only place that television exists as we perceive it is on the screen. Everywhere else, it's com uh, frequency fields, mathematics, and um, electrical systems. And it's the same with us. Jean Fourier... Um, a Frenchman, um, he developed something called the Fourier transform, which allowed pictures to be turned into frequency fields, broadcast, and then decoded into pictures. That's basically what our brain is doing on a vast, vastly more sophisticated level. So what is the matrix, this holographic internet we live in, or think we live in, we are part of its projection, it is energetic information. That's what it is. And we decode that information and what we decode and how we decode it decides our experienced reality. Decides what we um, experience. We are crystals, basically. And so often, of course, in receiver transmitting, you see the use of crystals. Um, the membrane of every cell, and we have trillions of them, is a crystalline substance. DNA is a crystalline um, substance. This is the membrane of um, a cell. And electrical uh, signals make these gates open and close, letting in what's good for the cell, keeping out what's bad for the cell, etc., etc., which is why when we get involved in a disruptive electrical and electromagnetic situations, these can open and close at the wrong times and lead to ill health. But we are crystals and we are transmitter receivers of information. And this was an article on DNA that I read. From the characteristic form of this giant molecule, a wound double helix, the DNA represents an ideal electromagnetic antennae. Yes, of course it does. On one hand, it is elongated and thus a blade which can take up very well electrical pulses. On the other hand, seen from above, it is as the form of a ring and thus is a very magnetical antennae. Don Juan, I think his name was, the shaman source of the... Uh, Carlos Castaneda books, is quoted as saying this, we are perceivers, we are awareness, we are not objects, we have no solidity, we are boundless, we or rather our reason forget this and thus we entrap the totality of ourselves in a vicious circle from which we rarely emerge in our lifetime. And we don't do that because we're not meant to. Society is structured to keep us there. And these influences, programming information, sense of uh, belief, the poisons we get in food and drink, religions that mess with our minds and close down our awareness, uh, education and all this other stuff, medical drugs are affecting the decoding of this information, what we decode, how we decode it, and um, what range we decode. And at the level of the real manipulators, that's coldly, calculatedly done to put us in a vibrational prison we call a world. Bewildered world, going through it 
what the hell is it all about? I don't understand. This is symbolic of the world we live in. For a body, computers. And we tap into this world wide web you might call the cosmic internet, the holographic internet. And it's not, um, this is symbolic, the wires between them, because it ain't like that. It's like this. This Brixton Academy has um, wireless internet. It's here, everywhere, around us. We can't see it, it's not affecting uh, our perception at all. But if I tune this computer to that Wi-Fi wireless internet, on that screen will suddenly appear that internet, that reality. And what we're living in, where are we, is a holographic internet and that information exists everywhere around us and we're decoding it unknowingly, though not now, increasingly, into this reality we think is the world. And so you had that scene in the Matrix movie, the first one, where Morpheus says, the Matrix is everywhere. It's all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell, taste or touch. A prison for your mind. And the matrix is everywhere because it is like a wireless internet which we're decoding. And we can decode vast areas of this internet. Or, as they do in China, that internet can be firewalled off so we only access that which suits those in control. And that's basically what's happened to us, not least through genetic manipulation. So what is reality? It's the frequency range that we are decoding and it's how we are decoding it. So when you've got miracles, there are no miracles. No such thing. There's only understanding reality more than you are when you perceive them as miracles. How can it be that you can walk through fire in a certain state of consciousness and not get burned, and you can walk through fire in another state of consciousness and be in the ambulance in 10 minutes? It's simply your connection, your interaction with reality is different. If you believe, and it's programmed into the software, that if you put your hand in fire it will burn, it will burn. But if you can go to another level of consciousness that's beyond that, then you can walk through fire and not get burned, as many people do. How can, that's not a miracle. It's just decoding reality in a different way. And we have the potential to decode a sod in paradise, which is why this has been kept from us. In the Matrix movie, there is no spoon. It is not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself, exactly. Yes, I saw this. Where there is love, there is pain. Bollocks. <laughs> Bollocks! Only if you believe there is. We are looking at a world of people imprisoned by their own perception of reality. There they are. There they could be. As William Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man and woman as it is, infinite. I think therefore I am, said Descartes. I compute therefore I am on a body consciousness level. I am therefore I am in terms of infinite consciousness. That's who we are. What's your name? Everything you can ever think of. And uh, just go through this before, I've loved, got kept to time well, purely by bloody accident, mine. Um, on one level, as I said earlier, this is a mathematical construct. This is one reason why things like numerology and numerological sequences are found all the time in 
um, secret society law and stuff. Um, and if you look at the codes of DNA, the, they've got a very uh, digital mathematical feel about them. Same with uh, uh, DNA when you look at it. Um, uh, we are digital on one level. The Earth grid, as above, so below. The Earth is an energetic construct in the same way that we are, and it has um, a uh, structure of energy lines called ley lines, meridian lines, whatever. Um, and these um, are very uh, geometrical in the way that they are laid out. Again, mathematics, ge geometry. And uh, algebra, I like it, yeah. <laughs> The Earth grid equals x uh, y squared, and um, <laughs> x y squared. Where did that come from? I don't know. Anyway, so is the, uh, the the grid, and the lines are, are geometrical. And what um, uh, a lot of people have now who've researched um, ancient um, uh, structures and temples and standing stones and what have you, they found that they are amazingly, stands back in amazement, in geometrical relationship to each other all over the world. How do they do that? Miraculous. No. If you have that ancient knowledge, and I'll come to that in the second half, or the second section, um, you know where these vortexes are. If you put a temple or a construction on that vortex, it is going to be in relationship geometrically to these other ones because you're putting it on a geometrically um, formed grid. And just like we have the chakra system of vortexes, so does the earth. And like I say, um, things like uh, Stonehenge and these great constructions of the ancient world were invariably put on these vortex points, which is where the geometrical relationship comes from. Also, because of this ancient knowledge I'll talk about um, when we've had a break, you find that uh, these great ancient constructions and temples and, and, and amazing uh, creations um, are using classic geometrical and mathematical codes like pi and golden mean, um, extraordinary. Also, what comes up a lot is uh, the Fibonacci sequence of numbers, which was um, attributed in terms of discovery, although it seems it was known long before, to this guy, Leonardo Pisano Fibonacci. I'm not sure, I think he was Italian, I'm not sure. And the Fibonacci sequence um, is you, you um, add the two numbers together to get the next one. And this sequence you find throughout nature and throughout the uh, formation and the relationships of parts of the human body and the human face, you find this Fibonacci sequence, because it, uh, that, that's the mathematical construct level of reality manifesting itself. The same with how flowers grow and how flowers are formed. This Fibonacci sequence of numbers and mathematics uh, comes up again and again and again. Same with these other golden mean and pi stuff as well. So this guy, Stephen Marquant, an American doctor who studied the human face and the human body from, a, I think it was a point of view of... Um, cosmetic surgery, um, started to see this obvious correlation between these mathematical codes and sequences and the human body. And he said this, all life is biology, all biology is physiology, all physiology is chemistry, all chemistry is physics, and all physics is math, or maths as we say here. And he might have added, and all maths is energy, because that's the next level of it. We live um, in a uh, almost a mechanical construct on one level as it plays out and through things like, like money and, and other things the manipulators have introduced and controlled, they're controlling the way or influencing the way this construct operates and turning us into robots and parts of the machine when we are infinite consciousness. It's the same with um, astrology. When we're born at a certain time, uh, we pick up energetic vibrational fields that are around at that time that are affected by the, the relationship of the planets of that time, the sun at that time. And they can influence us because this affects our um, 
body consciousness auric field and as we go through the sequences through our lives as the planets move we are going to be affected by them in a different way to someone born at another time in the cycle who will carry a different vibrational field and therefore interact with the uh, planets in a different way. And these forces, these same forces, are what hold planets in the positions they're in. And when those forces change or move, so do the planets. So, as we finish this first section, what is reality? Whatever we believe it is, and more than that, given what we're going to talk about in the second section, 